production. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Charles Lister and I'm a senior fellow and the director of the Countering Terrorism and Extremism and Syria programs at the Middle East Institute. Uh, I really hope you've enjoyed the first two panels of MEI's annual Counterterrorism Conference. If you've missed the sessions this morning uh, or you'll be unable to attend the final pan panel later this afternoon, you can watch recordings of all of them on MEI's website at the conclusion of the conference later today. For now, I'm delighted to welcome you to the third session of the conference, a keynote conversation with John T. Godfrey, the US State Department's Acting Coordinator for Counterterrorism and Acting Special Envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. John is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, whose previous post before joining the State Department's Counterterrorism Bureau was at the US Embassy in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where he served more than half of his 2015 to 18 tour as the Acting Deputy Chief of Mission. From 2013 to 14, John served as Chief of Staff to then Deputy Secretary of State Bill Burns during a particularly busy moment in time that encompassed Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, attempted annexation of Crimea, as well as the Egyptian Armed Forces removal of President Morsi and the explosive emergence of ISIS. John has also served previous posts in Vienna, Baghdad, Tripoli in Libya, Turkmenistan and Damascus, Syria, where he witnessed the succession of Bashar al-Assad after the death of his father Hafez. John, thank you very much for agreeing to join us. I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with you. Over the next 45 minutes, John and I will discuss US counterterrorism policy in the Middle East, Africa, and the AFPAC region. I'll begin posing audience questions in the closing 15 minutes or so. To submit your questions, please use Zoom's Q&A feature, which you can find on your Zoom screens. For those calling in by phone or watching our panel on our live stream, you can ask a question by emailing events at mei.edu. Before our discussion gets underway, Mr. Godfrey will be kicking things off with some opening remarks. So John, please, after you. Charles, thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you to you and MEI for inviting me to participate in this important event. Uh, I just wanna say at the outset that you've assembled really quite an impressive lineup of international counterterrorism experts for this conference with deep experiences and a broad range of background and perspectives. Um, many of them are people that I've uh, known and worked with. And um, so kudos to you for, uh, for getting a good roster uh, lined up for this discussion. And it really is a pleasure to participate in this conference. I'm looking forward to a good discussion. Uh, as the agenda notes, I'm currently the State Department's Acting Coordinator for Counterterrorism and uh, have been with the CT Bureau for about two and a half years. And as you noted for my sins, I'm now also the acting uh, special envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. Um, we're now about a month into the Biden-Harris administration, and I know that there's considerable interest in understanding how the new administration will tackle CT challenges ahead and what changes might be made to our CT operations and policies and approaches. There are at the risk of sounding like Captain Obvious, some, some limits to what I can say at this stage, um, but I do want to provide some insights into the administration's thinking on some of these important issues and uh, will be as candid as I can. Um, first, this administration is clear-eyed about the terrorist threats facing the United States and our partners and allies and recognizes full well that the terrorist threat is far from behind us at this point. As Secretary of State Blinken highlighted in his Senate confirmation hearing, we're still concerned about the ongoing threat posed by what's left of Al-Qaeda, as well as by ISIS and other extremist groups that target the United States. And he cautioned that while we did succeed in taking away ISIS's geographic caliphate in Iraq and Syria, we can't afford to take our eye off the ball. And he's also noted specifically that while uh, we've seen that um, redu reduced space that ISIS controlled, in Iraq and Syria, we've seen affiliates of both ISIS and Al-Qaeda spread to different parts of the world. So we obviously still have quite a lot of work cut out for us. Um, the administration also recognizes that this is a threat we can't tackle on our own. A successful CT approach is one that actively includes and involves our many partners and allies around the world. I think the 83 member de-ISIS coalition is a good example of that. It's one of the most effective multilateral efforts in history. And I think offers a ready example of how the United States can help lead a multilateral CT platform that leverages the tools and capabilities of countries around the globe against a common enemy. 
But I think the Biden-Harris administration also knows that while we have to pre proceed expeditiously and that terrorists won't stand idly by while new policies and approaches are being deliberately uh, deliberated, we also have to move forward strategically. And by that, um, I wanted to, or in that regard, I wanted to convey that at the outset of our discussion today, uh, it's important for me to note, uh, as well as at the beginning of my tenure, something that I think is quite important, uh, and that is to share with you the clear guidance that we have received from the Biden-Harris administration that we will avoid announcing major policy initiatives or posture adjustments in a way that comes as an unwelcome surprise to partners and allies. The expectation is that we will consult and that we will coordinate. We need to be consistent and we need to be thoughtful and we need to be consultative both within the US government, but also with our partners and allies. And that's part of why the Biden-Harris administration has launched several counterterrorism related strategic reviews to take stock of where we are on key issues and map out a path forward. At the top of that list, and this is something Charles, you and I were discussing uh, just ahead of, of kicking off this discussion, is the NSC-led domestic violent extremism 100-day sprint. That review, informed by the January 6th attack on the Capitol, aims to better understand the threat that dom domestic violent extremists pose, assess what the U.S. government is currently doing in this area, and determine what more needs to be done. And while the focus of that review, understandably, is first and foremost on the domestic threat, which is often referred to within the government as racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism, or REMV, we have to have an acronym after all. Um, we are also focused on the transnational uh, linkages of these domestic violent extremists. There's often a perception that REMB actors are largely isolated within their respective countries. However, we've seen increasing evidence of connections between those actors and REMB actors abroad, especially, but not only, in digital space. We've also heard concerns from a number of partners, foreign partners, that the United States is a central hub, particularly online, for global RENV ideology. The bottom line is that RENV is an issue that the US government is following increasingly closely and that will be a top priority for us in the years ahead. As FBI Director Ray testified last year, the Bureau has elevated RENV to be a, quote, national threat priority, which puts it on the same footing as ISIS which I think is a graphic reflection of how serious that threat is uh, and how uh, seriously it's regarded by the administration. The administration is also conducting a formal interagency review of detention policy, or rather of the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay in line with the broader goal of closing that facility. And it has launched a review of the agreement with the Taliban, including its CT assurances and associated posture issues an issue that obviously has important CT ramifications given the origins of the war in Afghanistan and the terrorist threats that endure. As President Biden recently said, he's seeking to bring to a responsible end uh, wars that have dragged on for far too long while continuing to ensure that terrorist threats cannot endanger the security of the American people. And while the terrorism threat remains serious, it's also important to notice, to note rather, that we've made some real progress in recent years. After success in defeating ISIS's territorial caliphate in Iraq and Syria and removing al-Baghdadi from the battlefield, the US-led coalition to defeat ISIS is continuing its vital work to tamp down ISIS in Iraq and Syria and is now playing a role in countering ISIS activity and networks globally, including in Africa. We held a coalition meeting focused on West Africa and the Sahel in November and anticipate expanding that focus to include East Africa a bit later this year. One key ISIS issue I really wanted to focus on uh, because I think it's something that has been and will remain quite important is that of foreign terrorist fighters and their family members. The United States has urged countries of origin to repatriate their foreign terrorist fighters or FTFs and their family members and we have led by example in that regard. To date, we've repatriated 12 adult US citizens and 16 US citizen minors from Syria and Iraq, and 10 of those adults have been charged with federal crimes. We've also taken custody of the so-called Beatles, the two remaining British citizens of that original quartet, who now face charges in US courts for their crimes against US citizens in the Syria and Iraq region. And we've also assisted a number of other countries in repatriating their foreign terrorist fighters and family members for rehabilitation, reintegration, and when it's appropriate, prosecution. 
I'd note that Kazakhstan has been a particular leader on this front, bringing back hundreds of FTFs and their family members and launching innovative new rehabilitation and reintegration programs. We've also focused intensively on building our partners' civilian CT capacities and particularly on developing so-called law enforcement finishes, by which we mean investigating, arresting, prosecuting, and incarcerating terrorists as opposed to killing them in an area of active hostility. Those tools, I think, have grown increasingly important as the terrorist threat itself has grown more decentralized and moved away from traditional military conflict zones, such as those in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. And we've seen real world impact of those sorts of civilian capacity building efforts in places like the Philippines, Bangladesh, Mali, Kenya, and Tunisia, among a number of other locations. But uh, good examples of partners that we've helped train and equip preventing terrorist attacks before they take place and responding effectively to terrorist incidents more quickly and more effectively. We've also worked closely with the Departments of Defense and Justice to build partners' capacity to collect and use battlefield evidence in civilian criminal proceedings. And that's been critical in ensuring that foreign terrorist fighters don't escape accountability for the crimes that they've committed in Iraq and Syria. And part of that effort has involved leveraging platforms like Operation Gallant Phoenix, which is a multinational information sharing effort to better collaborate and share information that can empower countries to actually bring effectively those sorts of prosecutions. I'd like to say that the international community has really taken some significant strides in this area in recent years with the United Nations and NATO, the Council of Europe, Interpol and the EU, all having taken significant steps to develop new guidelines, protocols uh, and procedures on how to use battlefield evidence. And in some cases, that's really involved taking on uh, long-standing skepticism and concern about the appropriateness of using that kind of information in civilian prosecutions. So uh, those are just a few of the examples of the sorts of civilian capacity building efforts uh, we've been focused on and some of the successes we've had in recent years. Uh, I wanted to highlight those at the top, but obviously I'm very keen to engage in a discussion that's a little bit more focused on the Middle East in particular, and look forward to uh, the discussion with you, Charles, and then uh, equally importantly, the questions uh, to come after that. Brilliant, John, thank you so much for, for those fascinating opening remarks. I think you covered an awful lot of ground from, from the outset, and it definitely gives us some material to, to work with. I think from the outset, I'd like to ask you, um, for kind of uh, your own assessment of the, the DISIS uh, campaign, uh, the status of um, not just sort of our actions as part of the coalition and the coalition writ large, but you know, also kind of as an analyst, if I put my analyst hat on, um, ISIS has kind of demonstrated um, uh, a few worrying uh, uh, trends in the last uh, few weeks or months, including a uh, fairly significant attack in Baghdad, um, in Syria, they're quite clearly, I think, resurging in the in the regime-controlled central desert on the other side of the Euphrates from from where we operate. But I think, sort of, suffice to say, ISIS clearly isn't gone. Um, there's still a fairly substantial challenge to come. But as you said, uh, and as we all know, um, you know, the incoming uh, new administration is quite clearly uh, keen to um, pay more attention to great power competition. Uh, spread other resources or more resources elsewhere. Um, and perhaps CT is, uh, at least the perception is, counterterrorism is being sort of left on a, on a lower rung of priority. So with that ISIS situation in mind and with that broader reality um, here in DC, you know, what are we uh, continuing to do? What is your assessment of, of ISIS in its Syrian Iraqi heartlands? And what do you think needs to be done going forward? That's, um, that's a big question, uh, or several sets of questions encompassed in one, and I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, to tackle those, uh, and happy to unpack at greater length any of them that we don't do justice to in the first uh, go around. I would start by noting uh, what I think is a really important analytical point, which is that ISIS underwent uh, um, a fairly serious period of uh, evolution in the period of 2019 to 2020. So just to highlight sort of the most important aspects of that, you had the, the loss of the so-called physical caliphate uh, signified by the fall of Baghuz. You had shortly thereafter the really horrific attacks that uh, were staged in Colombo, Sri Lanka and claimed by a, an ISIS-aligned group. 
Right after that, you had the first videotaped statement by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi um, claiming uh, or pointing to that attack and highlighting it as an example of how ISIS would like to use its uh, branches and affiliates going forward as platforms from which to carry forward the fight. That's his formulation. Baghdadi himself was removed uh, later in tw uh, 2019. And then throughout, uh, you had two parallel processes that I think were quite significant. One, uh, ISIS undertook a fairly significant reorganization internally, uh, devolving and delegating more authority and resources to branches and affiliates, including in some instances, authorities to execute attacks. And uh, as well, the real metastasization or proliferation of branches and networks, especially in Africa, where I think we've all been uh, alarmed and in some cases, frankly, caught a bit off guard um, by how quickly ISIS networks and affiliates have emerged uh, and constituted capability and in some cases uh, begun to affect uh, control over geographic space. So I, I guess to your question about how does this relate back to ISIS in the core? Uh, the global coalition remains keenly focused on the, uh, the enduring ISIS threat in the core. That's both on the Iraq and Syria sides of that uh, border. And I think there's a clear-eyed understanding that it's vitally important that we continue to tamp down any nascent ISIS resurgence in that geographic space. And to that end, we continue to partner with uh, Syrian partners on the Syrian side of the border, as well as with, with the Iraqi government. Um, to ensure that they've got the capabilities that they need uh, to undertake their part of that fight. And of course, we do still have U.S. military assets uh, in both places uh, that are uh, critical, frankly, in providing some of the enablers that allow our local partners uh, to get after that problem set. Um, so that remains, I think, um, the, the lodestar for the global coalition, uh, and the U.S. administration has certainly signaled uh, that we remain seized of that threat. And President Biden himself, as you may have heard a few days ago at the Munich Security Conference, made it quite clear that uh, we cannot afford to allow ISIS to resurge or reconstitute capability uh, and certainly to reestablish uh, anything like a physical safe haven from which they can plan and execute external operations akin to what we saw in, the, in some not too distant uh, parts of the past. Um, you highlighted as well the very significant aspect of, of resources, um, and frankly, I think one of the things that I was very happy to see uh, in the readout I, I got of the, the first session today was that there was a bit of good discussion about the what I would regard as, frankly, a bit of a specious binary um, delineation between great power competition or near-peer competition on the one hand and counterterrorism on the other. Uh, I think that if you're doing it right, counterterrorism directly buttresses efforts to uh, compete with near peer um, uh, competitors. Uh, and it does that in a couple of really important ways. One, it uh, allows us to remain a, a security partner of choice uh, for security partners who, or rather for foreign partners, who I think often um, candidly prefer to work with the United States. That's true for a couple of reasons. One, the kit we provide is typically quite good. Um, it's world class. We have done a good job down through the decades of elaborating protocols for ensuring that that kit, when it's transferred, is uh, well maintained and remains usable for some meaningful amount of time. That's not always the case with some of the, the equipment that gets provided by other partners. But in addition, particularly in counterterrorism and security space, uh, the United States uh, has unparalleled experience and frankly a, a good track record of efficacy and I think that that's something that's appealing for foreign partners as well. Um, and so when we look for example to a place like Africa where uh, you do have burgeoning terrorist threats, uh, I think that there's obviously an interest by some of our near-peer competitors to uh, take advantage of that, to, um, to partner with, uh, with um, countries there. And our argument would be that there's a good reason for the United States to be uh, invested in and, and part of that mix. Um, one, to ensure that those threats are effectively addressed, um, but frankly, also because it serves some of our broader strategic interests. I know I didn't address everything that you mentioned, Charles, but um, I'm happy to, to circle back to anything that I may have overlooked. 
No, I, th I think that's I think that's great. You you raised a yeah, in, indeed a kind of intriguing uh, uh, issue that came up in the first panel today, which was uh, yeah, exactly as you described it, raising the relationship between great power competition and the the rise and evolution of of terrorism threats. Uh, and as part of that conversation, there was also um, and we also had a, a long chat about proxies, uh, state power proxies, and that relationship or interconnection with, with terrorism. And there I wanted to ask you an, uh, perhaps another sort of somewhat challenging question um, and a timely one, uh, which was uh, the subject of a debate in panel two, which was to discuss Iran and the Houthis and the, and the war in Yemen. Um, and clearly, um, you know, as everyone uh, watching this will be will be well aware, uh, the Biden Harris administration recently delisted um, the Houthis. Um, but as you're well aware, and as many of us are too, um, many of the activities that the Houthis are conducting, both internally but also externally, against governments like Saudi Arabia, um, uh, and potentially there was just some reporting by the Associated Press today about. Uh, a drone attack on Saudi from Iraq, uh, which is of course not the Houthis, but Iranian proxies um, in that country. How do we go about dealing with um, state-backed proxies, whether we label them terrorists or not, um, when there are clearly broader geopolitical interests uh, at play? And this administration has made no secret of its interest, at least in exploring avenues for renegotiating uh, a, a nuclear accord with Iran. So what kind of challenges does that pose to you, the CT Bureau, um, in terms of dealing with that very complicated gray area between organizations that for one, want of a better word are terrorist organizations, but whose clear linkages to state powers um, make our response much more complex? Uh, it's a it's a really good question. As you noted, it's a, a difficult one, also a timely one. Um, just to to start um, with the question of or the aspect of the question that dealt with the, the Houthi designations, um, to reiterate what has already been publicly said by the administration at, at more senior levels, that decision was taken uh, very much with the um, focus on the humanitarian assistance impacts of the original foreign terrorist organization and specially designated global terrorist designations uh, and how those had impacted the ability of humanitarian assistance providers and critically commercial food importers to get food into Yemen, a country that is um, suffering from food insecurity and, and has been for some time by dint of the, the conflict there. Uh, in no way was the administration or is it under any illusions about the nature of the Houthi threat and the decision to revoke those designations was not meant in any way to uh, signal that we are looking to adopt a different approach to the Houthis in terms of their, their malign activities. It was, again, very squarely focused on the humanitarian concerns. Um, and so I just wanted to, to make sure that that was clearly understood uh, the Houthis and I would argue um, some of the, um, the Iranian proxy groups up in, in Iraq um, do represent a particularly complicated challenge, as you noted, uh, and they're, they have become quite adroit um, at the art of plausible deniability and asymmetric warfare, uh, which makes them a particularly um, potent adversary. I think that um, what, what the administration has been trying to do, and, and Yemen is a good example of this, is to uh, frankly use uh, sunlight as, as a little bit of a disinfectant, if I can use that formulation, um, by uh, shining a light on, on what some of the uh, Houthi malign activities are and how much responsibility they bear for the overall deterioration of conditions in Yemen, including the food insecurity piece. But um, there's a whole litany of um, uh, pretty horrific things that have uh, happened in Yemen. Uh, during the time that the Houthis have controlled the area in which 80% of Yemenis live. Uh, so very difficult, I think, to argue in anything like an intellectually honest way that they don't bear a large share of culpability uh, for what we're currently um, grappling with collectively uh, in Yemen. Um, the fact that we revoked those two particular designations does not mean that designations as a tool don't remain something that's in our toolkit. Uh, and that we're able to, to use. Uh, I think that uh, it was highlighted at the time we revoked both the FTO and SDGT designations that the designations that had previously been done by Treasury under its authorities against the three individually named Houthi leaders remained in effect. Uh, 
Uh, and similarly, we've undertaken uh, designations against uh, a number of groups and individuals in Iraq, uh, in part to, to dry up uh, the, uh, the resources that those people dispose of and their ability to use the licit financial system, um, but also, frankly, to, to uh, signal um, that we are aware of what they're doing, we understand who they are, uh, and designations are uh, one tool, but not the only tool that can be brought, brought to bear against them. Um, let me stop there. Great, thank you. I've, I have a million questions, but I see we're also getting lots in from the audience. So perhaps I'll ask you one more uh, before we move over to the Q&A. Um, perhaps I'll ask you about something else you mentioned in your opening comments, which was about um, places like Al Hol and Al Raj and these camps and, and the repatriation issue, which, uh, you know, I'm well aware the US has actually a comparatively be much better record than some of our European allies in terms of repatriating citizens. But there is also actually a question in the Q&A, which is really, what kind of sort of leverage do we have or what hope do we have that our allies will um, be more constructive in the repatriation request that essentially we as the US have been uh, conveying for several years now. Um, there was some news reporting in the last couple of days that um, one of the larger sort of prison camps in Syria is about to be expanded significantly um, thanks to uh, British funding. Um, that to me strikes me as kind of a short-term solution because it's still not answering the question as to what we do with all of these people long-term. So I just wonder if you could perhaps expand a little bit more on uh, whether there are ongoing conversations about repatriation, whether you think there is more the US can do um, to encourage more progress on that file, and perhaps worst case, if there isn't any progress, what do you think the, uh, the consequences will be? Uh, that's a really thoughtful question. I'm just taking a quick note to make sure that I um, address the most salient bits of, of the, the good exposition you just gave, Charles. I, I, let me start by, first of all, um, applauding uh, Her Majesty's government for the, the contribution to expansion of the, the camp. Um, I think that it's important to understand that um, the conditions in the camps are often quite dire, um, which is uh, something that frankly contributes to the difficulty of maintaining security in those facilities, uh, but also uh, that has a knock-on consequence in terms of whether people are able to more or less uh, get in and out of them. Uh, and there are some specific threats that are associated with that that are um, quite problematic. So we, we appreciate the UK funding, um, but to your broader point, we remain concerned, quite concerned, that more countries uh, have not stepped up uh, from our vantage to uh, assume responsibility for their citizens and repatriate both the FTFs, but also the associated family members. And just to give a sense of the scale of what we're talking about here, there are about 2,000 foreign terrorist fighters, third country national foreign terrorist fighters, if I can use that formulation, so non-Syrian, non-Iraqi, currently in the custody of the Syrian Democratic Forces in Northeast Syria. There are about 10,000 associated family members uh, who are mostly in IDP camps. Uh, you mentioned two of them, uh, Roj and al -Hol. Uh That is a significant um, number of people. And one of the things that I think we have been most concerned about is that the situation on any given day in Northeast Syria can be, um, frankly, less than stable. Um, we saw that in particular with uh, the Turkish incursion, uh, when there were some real questions about the extent to which the SDF would be able to maintain positive control of the facilities at which these individuals, particularly the FTFs, were being held. Uh, there is the concern that on any given day, um, for any number of, of reasons, whether those are related to Russian, Turkish, Iranian, or Syrian regime uh, efforts, um, the situation could change. And what at all costs we are keen to prevent is a situation in which some or more of those individuals end up um, getting out from under positive control. And in particular, that is a problem because many of those individuals, many of the 2,000 foreign terrorist fighters and their family members either have European citizenship or plausible claims to it. So from our perspective, and this is a conversation we, we have with our European counterparts, it's principally the European countries that are, that are um, source countries for many of these individuals, although not only, there are a number in uh, elsewhere in the Middle East and North Africa as well, 
But the conversation is essentially to highlight that, as you indicated, the approach is, is a short-term one. And in some respects, um, that's, that's an absolutely necessary thing to do. But the only long-term viable solution that we see to the, the broader concern about what these individuals might do down the road is to repatriate them in an orderly way and then really focus keenly on something that I, I think candidly the international community has been a little slow to realize, and that is the vital importance of rehabilitation and reintegration protocols, as well as having sufficiently robust national laws that allow prosecution when that's really what's warranted. And in the case of some of those individuals, um, that's probably the, the most responsible disposition option, but certainly not for all of them. And here I would just say that the, the sort of doomsday scenario that we all worry about, not a little, is that you have a very large number of children or minors in that cohort of 10,000. And um, they've been through some pretty horrific experiences. Um, we've seen indications of radicalization in, um, in kids as young as 10 and 11 years of age. Uh, and there's real concern about what happens to them down the road uh, if they end up um, getting out uh, of the camps and, and kind of moving back to their countries uh, in an ad hoc way that doesn't afford national governments the opportunity to provide things like so psychosocial services and care uh, that many of those individuals badly need. And then of course, on the, the other side of that coin is, is the threat uh, concern and what those individuals may do uh, some number of years down the road. So it's a huge problem. It's one we're keenly focused on. Um, we have we have devoted um, bilaterally uh, resources to helping countries develop rehabilitation and reintegration protocols. We have some really terrific US uh, subject matter experts. Um, it's a, a small but very capable group uh, that have helped with some countries with that um, line of effort. And we've also been engaged with multilateral partners, um, including the United Nations uh, Office of Counterterrorism uh, to try to get some more attention and resources focused on the part of this problem set that, that deals with how you responsibly rehabilitate and reintegrate um, these individuals at the juncture at which political will is mustered to go ahead and affect their, uh, their repatriation. Got it, John, thank you. Um, I'll, let me ask you a couple related questions that have come in through the Q&A, uh, both relating to Africa. Um, uh, one comes from Eric Schmidt of the New York Times, and he's asked, um, in its waning months, the Trump administration withdrew virtually all 700 US troops from Somalia. Uh, how do you assess uh, whether Shabab is exploiting that absence? And what do you think will be the longer term impact of a US pullout? And then a related question um, came from Didier Laura, who's asked uh, about um, the former administration's desire also to leave the Sahel. Uh, what is the current U.S. policy um, regarding the Sahel and West African region in terms of uh, CT? Great. Let me uh, maybe take the second question first, and, and then I'll work, uh, work to the Somalia-related one. Uh, I think in terms of current U.S. policy in the Sahel, um, the, the Biden-Harris administration, I think, remains keenly aware of how um, dangerous that that uh, area is. Uh, there obviously has been um, a pretty alarming, uh, frankly, progression of the threat in that environment. One of the things I would point to in particular that isn't always widely appreciated is that uh, unlike many places in, in West Africa and the Sahel, we've seen instances where Al-Qaeda and ISIS, rather than competing with each other, as we've seen in places like Somalia, have actually uh, episodically collaborated with each other. Um, and that's both tactically and in some cases uh, at a more strategic level, which makes it a, a particularly threatening um, uh, sort of dynamic that we've got. Um, so the part of the, the new administration's uh, focus in the course of conducting its strategic reviews is taking a hard look at these sorts of issues. Uh, I think that um, without pronouncing on behalf of the Department of Defense or the administration, uh, we, I think, are, are aware that we need to remain invested in West Africa and the Sahel. Uh, and that's in two forms. Uh, one is uh, continuing to work with partners uh, to, to provide enablers uh, and other sorts of things that allow them 
to help uh, effectively get after and address some of these threats. And I think there is an understanding that there will be a requirement for some continuing uh, US military presence as, as well. Uh, I don't wanna speak to force levels or anything that specific, but I, I think in the main, there's an understanding that um, we will continue to need to have uh, some of that presence there. Um, to the issue of Somalia that was raised by Eric Schmidt, um, I think that that is uh, something that um, is, um, there's, there's no question but that the threat uh, posed by al-Shabaab um, remains. And we are concerned both about the, the threat that it constitutes with respect to Somalia itself, um, but also given its history of attacks across the border into Kenya in particular, uh, the threat that al-Shabaab poses to, to regional stability. Um, so one of the things that I think um, we would expect to be taken into consideration as we work through these different strategic reviews um, is, uh, is consideration of whether we're appropriately postured uh, with respect to the nature of the threat. Great, thank you. Let me um, go on to uh, zoom across the map to Afghanistan uh, and ask you another question um, or a series of questions that I'd received which are more or less related. Um, and the general point is um, that uh, the, the Biden-Harris administration appears to be somewhat more skeptical of at least some of the terms of the agreement that had previously been agreed with the Taliban, particularly attaining to their relationship with Al-Qaeda, uh, and whether or not there has been or is likely to be any change in terms of the assessment on, on that particular issue uh, and, and what that may or may not mean for uh, Afghanistan policy going forward. Yeah, um, no question, but that that's uh, a vital issue, particularly given um, the the role of Afghanistan historically in um, in 9/11. Uh, but uh, obviously, the the longest war we've had in our country's history as well. Um, I'm not tipping any state secrets here by saying that there is certainly a, a concerted Afghanistan policy review underway, and that an important feature of that includes looking at the the nature of the counterterrorism assurances that the Taliban gave, uh, and specifically with respect to, um, to its relationship with Al Qaeda. Uh, I think that that's not something I'm in a position to share any more detail on today. Um, it's, it's a very uh, dynamic conversation. And uh, I think that it's one that um, the administration is, is very focused on and very keen to, to get right. Um, as with a lot of these challenges, um, um, that, is, that is hard to do, frankly. Um, the options uh, are not all great. I'll just leave it there. Got it. I, I definitely appreciate it. It's, uh, it's a difficult time with uh, various reviews going on, but I appreciate you um, uh, being able to answer at least part of that question. Uh, another one is, I guess, zooming a bit higher up um, uh, and looking at Kind of the evolution of some of the terrorist threats we've faced over the last 10 to 20 years and again this was something that's been touched upon that was particularly touched upon on the first panel today um, which was the kind of the the move um, from globally oriented jihadist terrorism to somewhat more locally oriented um, jihadist terrorism and i think that's something we've seen in africa uh, in parts of the middle east um, clearly, obviously, the Taliban is kind of the archetypal example of that. Um, and seeing as both AQ and ISIS both seem to be traveling in that direction, um, whether senior command is instructing them to do so or not, um, I guess one of the implications has been, well, if they're locally oriented, then it's not a problem for, um, for sort of US national security. It's certainly not necessarily a threat to the homeland. So it's something that can be put on the back burner. And I obviously recognize that's a fairly simplistic way of, uh, of explaining that point, but it's certainly been argued by, by many. I just wonder if you have a, a response to that. Is that something that we should be dealing with as determinedly as we were with, for example, ISIS's territorial caliphate? Is this something that demands a different approach, which is, I think, um, probably true? Um, and if so, uh, how? Uh, it's a really thoughtful question and, uh, and, and an important one, I think, to, to think about. Um, what I would offer is that while threats that appear to be primarily local or even regional at a given point in time um, may uh, 
prompt the temptation to, to think that we don't need to focus on them. Uh, I think that history has shown that there is, in some cases, a tendency for those places to quite rapidly become um, a safe harbor or safe haven from which groups can consolidate, uh, uh, have the ability to facilitate operations, and indeed plan and conduct external operations. Uh, Afghanistan is probably uh, the most apt example of that that I can think of offhand, uh, going back to, to the pre-9-11 period. And so one of the things that we grapple with, frankly, in the counterterrorism community inside the U.S. government is how do you try to accurately assess where a given region is on that spectrum uh, or along that range of, of um, places at a given time? Um, I, I think that to be very honest, um, it often uh, involves more um, art than science, if I can use that formulation. And by that, I mean, um, we have the great good fortune to have a, a very capable counterterrorism community that has um, grown and evolved, and um, I think learned quite a lot since September 11th, uh, including about how to um, focus on reducing the ability of groups to consolidate safe havens from which they can plan and conduct external operations. Um, but I don't want to overstate that. It, it is um, difficult to, um, to make those sorts of judgments uh, about where a given region falls uh, on, the, on the spectrum of things there. And, and you mentioned something I think is quite important as well um, that I just want to touch on briefly, Charles, and that is I think both Al-Qaeda and ISIS, um, which have suffered frankly, tremendous losses of, of capability and, and just people, senior people in particular, um, during the course of um, the last decade plus, um, have looked at increasingly decentralized models and looked further afield geographically uh, at ways to carry forward um, their, uh, their fights um, by focusing on networks and branches um, further outside of Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, uh, and, and that is something I think that is important for a couple of reasons. One, it means the, the threat is, is more geographically diffuse. That creates complications in terms of our ability to, um, frankly, collect intelligence, um, but also conduct operations when it comes to doing that. It also, I think, highlights something that I, I would hope um, the audience listening in on the net today comes away from this conversation with which is an appreciation for the fact that we're moving into, I would argue we've moved into an era in which, in addition to applying military force against terrorist targets in geographically distinct areas of active hostility, like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, there's going to be a greater need for focusing on uh, less military-centric capabilities in some of these geographically far-flung places. West Africa, I think, is probably a good example um, there are certainly others, but in those places, you're going to be having to, I think, focus more or rely more on civilian counterterrorism capacity, and that's, uh, again, arresting, prosecuting, investigating, and, and uh, incarcerating individuals, and that puts a real premium on helping ensure that local partners have effective so-called judicial chains, which is to say that you've got investigators, prosecutors, judges, police and security forces who have responsibility for terrorism-related cases and have the understanding and the tools to know how to deal with those uh, in a way that meets legal muster within their respective national judiciaries. That's actually something the Counterterrorism Bureau at the State Department's been quite keenly focused on for the last seven years, uh, several years, excuse me, and uh, certainly working with other partners throughout the U.S. government and multilateral institutions it's something that will be keenly focused on going forward because I think it will be an increasingly prominent feature of the landscape. John, thank you so much. I think somewhat remarkably, we're basically out of time. Um, I have, uh, I have, and the audience has many, many other questions, um, but they'll have to uh, unfortunately wait for another time. But I think, um, you know, what else to say other than thank you so much for, for taking the time uh, to uh, provide us with your opening remarks, but also to answer the many questions that we've thrown your way. Um, very much appreciate all of the work you're doing and, uh, and uh, look forward to continuing to cooperate with, with you and your office. But in the meantime, thank you again so much. And uh, thank you to our audience for, for tuning in. Thank you, Charles. It was a pleasure. And uh, thanks very much to the, the folks who took time to, uh, to listen to the